public records, our very favorite topic. So, we are, we have a couple different things going on. We have S305, which is, um, and Allison, I, your friend couldn't come today, Ellen Kaler. I guess she, um, Ellen couldn't? I don't know. No, she had a um, doctor's appointment that was not something that she oh, could too bad. Switch. So she so, wants to come in at another time. Though. She would love to, I know. Yeah, we just, we, we'll do this one more time after this, I think. But we only have a couple weeks left before crossover. So we want to get it out. Right, I'm just sorry we didn't yeah. do it on the day she was available. Yeah, anyway, there we are. Well, I didn't yeah. know she wasn't there yeah. until we tried. Um, so what I think, um, one of the, so we have S305, which is the, the Senator Brock's bill about the nonprofits. And then we have all the kind of other public um, records issues that <clears throat> we're going to, if we come up with anything, we're going to use S305 as the vehicle. So people need to both weigh in on S305 itself, but also on all those other issues because that's, that's what we're going to um, use. Anything that we come up with is gonna go into this bill. Does that make sense? The, the 305 is the vehicle. Yes, yes. So one of, the, one of the things that has come up, and I don't see, oh well, we're just at 1.30. Um, oh. Somebody, Gwen, you can, if you want to sit or somebody wants to sit in the window, you're welcome to do that. Um, Gwen. You're also welcome to put a chair Wait. up here. Okay. check. Okay. Although I think it's way um, And if we can find another chair in another room, you're welcome to. I'm okay. I just asked you. Or you can crawl over the table. <laughs> I just asked you to bring back a chair that she follows. <gasps> we may have one more thing. <laughs> oh! <laughs> made it. I got it. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so what we're going to do then is there one issue that came up when we started talking about public records is when we first passed the dispensary bill, we made everything off limits to around the dispensaries. Their locations, their, I mean, it, everything essentially was off limits. Because, and we needed, <clears throat> we did a lot of things in the dispensary that have changed over the years, but we needed to be as tight as possible to get it passed in the first place. So we did that. So um, Deputy Commissioner Herrick brought that, it up to me that there was some inconsistencies here because um, now dispensaries have locations. So keeping the location a secret isn't really part of a public records exemption. And so we wanted to look at that. So what I've done, I think, are there three of you here that want to speak to this? Do you, um, who, how do you want to start? Yeah. Is, Why don't you go ahead, you're standing there. Oh, thanks. <laughs> 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 well, I, yeah, I didn't know if maybe the deputy uh, commissioner wanted to. If you want to just, uh, yeah, sure. yeah, why don't you just um, lay the, the scene for right. us? And, um, <laughs> and is there anybody else here who is interested in this particular little topic of public records, the dispensaries? Does the dispensaries, Jane? I know you are. Okay. Thank you. Please. For the record, I'm um, Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety, Christopher Harris. And the question um, arises with respect to public records requests for dispensaries. And um, it states records which by law are designated confidential or exempt from public inspection and copy, copying CBSA, 
section 317C1, the PRA further states that records which by law may only be disclosed specifically designated persons are exempt from public inspection and copying. Um, and so the confidentiality um, <coughs> provisions afforded to dispensaries, the way it works essentially is this. Uh, we get a number of public records requests from um, the press, for instance. And it, obviously, anything to do with patients um, and caregivers, um, we should be confidential. But other areas, such as uh, any kind of complaints that might have been filed, um, the names of primary um, owners, owners of dispensaries, locations of dispensaries. What the way it works is we request of the dispensary permission to release that information. And in some cases it's granted and in other cases it's not. And so um, that's kind of the, where we are right now. And it, it's, it's perhaps I'm not sure I wasn't here at the beginning of creating the um, exemption, if you will, for the dispensaries. I'm sure that was done in a great deal of concern for confidentiality of patients and caregivers, which we would um, obviously follow regardless because of HIPAA, for instance. Um, there's a, a, a wall between that, those records, even though they're housed at the Department of Public Safety and law enforcement. Uh, they're not in the same database. And in fact, it has to be part of a, uh, a legitimate ongoing investigation for law enforcement to request access to that information. So for instance, somebody is pulled over and they're found to have quantities of marijuana or cannabis, I'm supposed to say now, uh, in the vehicle, they say, oh, well, I'm, um, I'm a registrant. We're yeah. on the registry, the law enforcement can query that and, and find that out to verify it or to see in the car. But, um, so that's, that's the position we're in at the Department of Public Safety right now. Okay. <clears throat> well, I, I do remember when we first did it, we took a tour to the, um, <clears throat> the um, Montpelier facility. And we had to all go in different cars and take circuitous routes. Over and we right. went all over like that. this. And some of us got lost and because we couldn't disclose the location. Some of the irony there is that the locations, I believe, um, are on the websites. Yes, and big signs outside. Well, no. that, I don't believe that's the case. No. I think that's that would be in violation oh, of the statute. Okay, you can't have it. However, and Act 250. What they do have. Size is size. Oh, no, but we still, regardless of whether it's in the, the public domain, and I'm sure they will testify to, that we make requests. We've had the request for this information. Do you mind? Can we yeah. um, move it forward or not? Do you want to redact this information? And so that's the current process. Okay. All right. So let's hear from the dispensaries about <clears throat> what and and figure out what should how we should word this so that we keep confidential the information that needs to be confidential, but um, don't keep confidential information that is on people's website. Okay. So, Virginia, Virginia Renfrew with the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association, and uh, Shane Lynn is here, mm -hmm. and so uh, he and I, can, I thought, could just kind of do this together, right? Yeah, uh, no, that's, if that's okay. No, that's fine. And um, so, just for your information, if you want to know that this is in the rules around uh, Title 18. Uh, and, and so it's the confidentiality piece. And this is what the dispensaries have been operating on. Um, just, just um, so I think that um, 
you know, when, when this, you know, in the very beginning, if we look back to 2000, before the dispensaries even existed, and the law was passed to allow patients to, um, to grow uh, cannabis, we had confidentiality. We wanted to make sure the patients and the caregivers and healthcare professionals were protected and that that information would never uh, be given out. And we would continue to want that to be, including the healthcare professionals, um, to be uh, kept confidential. Um, I think that there are pieces of, uh, under the dispensaries, we've seen over the last probably couple of years an increase in um, people wanting more information about them. Um, and so there are some things that we still believe should be kept confidential. Um, and so just, uh, you know, and, and maybe I'll let Shane talk a little bit about that of, you know, when you, so the dispensaries used to be nonprofits and they're now for-profits. Um, so uh, individuals can um, uh, invest in a dispensary. And as we all know that under federal law, it is still illegal to, uh, cannabis is still considered an illegal substance. So when you have somebody who does want to invest, um, and if that name is going to be given out publicly, they probably are not going to invest. Um, and so I think that that's, and I'll change if you want to talk a little bit. Uh, just that privacy is similar to anybody, you know, any other business, private business raising money if you're a brewery and you invest in a brewery. Your name's going to remain private. Um, so, you know, investors, you know, at least our current investors are operating under this current rules and regulations and that their, their privacy is going to be respected. Uh, and so we really go to lengths to, to follow the rules and provide that for our investors. I think there are a lot of people that we do currently work with uh, that if their names are being brought up in newspaper articles, online, that they're probably going to avoid getting involved in the industry. Uh, because it's, you know, there's other places to invest money without the same kind of attention. Do, in a private concern, like you said, a brewery or a shoe factory or anything else, do we disclose the names of investors? I, I don't think so, unless it's a public... It depends on how it's formed yeah. with the Secretary of State. Exactly. And then if it's a publicly held company. Uh, yes. They're, well, if they're, obviously. But there are certain LLC types. I mean, there are certain places where investors right. are... Are, are public in there, some that are. Yep, uh, exactly. And okay. so, and that's back to the conversation you have with the investor, what kind of uh, structure you've set up. Um, and I'd say, you know, for us, we've been following these rules uh, with the intent that their names were going to remain private. Um, and so we reckon, you know, like as far as the location now, um, uh, you know, pretty much that's out. I mean, I still have people who live in Montpelier asking where the Montpelier dispensary is. Like, they have no idea where it is. Yeah. Uh, which is fine, you know. But because you can there tell isn't, where it because, is. well, there's no big sign out there. Right. And um, you can tell them where it is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And now yeah. we, yeah, we went through it. In the beginning, we didn't provide that address until the person was registered. Then they got the address potentially. We worked with the DPS actually to say, hey, can we put it on our website now? This was probably a year or two after it being opened. Uh, the signage is, there is signage at least, because uh, it is confusing for a patient to show up at a multiple business, uh, you know, location and not know what door to go in. So there is small signage, at least numbers that are on the wall potentially to, to highlight where they uh, are visiting or where they should visit, what door they should knock on. Um, our, our facility up in Milton at this point, it doesn't have a name on it, but it has our number on it. So I yeah. think our, our locations are probably known at this point. Uh, again, things have really changed over the past seven years. Uh, you know, seven years ago, it, it was a very big deal mm -hmm. uh, to be doing this, and everybody was concerned about security um, and obviously the patient's privacy. Um, and luckily, um, there's been few incidents uh, of security over the seven years. So, um, so what should be kept confidential? What should be um, exempt? Patient information. Health uh, provider care, information, caregiver, healthcare professional, mm -hmm. uh, and we would request that uh, uh, like our applications that have our security systems in the application, we renew each year. So we give a you know potential we do we give a diagram of our building where security is located in the building. You know all those types of documents we request to remain private. Uh, 
investors uh, potentially to remain private unless uh, they had a controlling interest, I guess, you know, if they were, uh, I mean, that's, that's where the information would be potentially listed on the secretary's website, so. Um, and there's, yeah, there's probably other detailed stuff we could come up with a list for you uh, to highlight. There are, we do have 273, I think it is, exemptions. And a lot of them um, address things like um, trade secrets and proprietary information and stuff. So I think that stuff, that is so, already. Because some of that is in the application too. If we come up with a new product, it's a new offering that we're, you know, that, that'll be in the renewal application. So there are trade secrets in there as well. Yeah. But, and that definitely is already covered under other exemptions. I don't think we have to put any special exemptions okay. in here. And I would well, wonder, I would just say around the application that they put in every year because it does have their whole security system in there. Is that already covered under existing? It says that security, security systems it's, are covered under exemptions. So, so what might happen is that the application itself might not be might be subject to public record, but all of that stuff would be redacted and taken out. Security systems are covered under another exemption, and proprietary and trade secrets are covered under other exemptions. Chris? So yeah, you make a good point, Madam Chair, that we get requests for all sorts. We Department of Public Safety receives 60% of all public records requests of state government. And some of our exemptions, we're well familiar with the, the exemptions that we can apply. And security is one of them, safety and security. Anything that would lead to an understanding of, for instance, how the state police protects dignitaries who visit the state or the governor, uh, or other even things that happen here in the state house in terms of um, safety and security. So those things can be exempted, redacted from the document. Um, and we're we do that with almost every document we release is redacted in some way, um, whether it's PII, personal identifying information, I apologize, um, security information, things like that. And I get, yeah, back to even our employees, you know, employee names. I mean, there are things that are uh, transmitted between us as an organization and the DPS that involve employees. So there would potentially be some privacy concerns around that as well. So do we even need to make any kind of a, do anything about this at all, since all the things that you want covered are already covered <clears throat> under other exemptions? So I don't see where security is. I know I'm scanning this fast, no, you, uh, but I didn't see security in this that was already it's covered. Like it's, it's covered just under under application, <laughs> application, supporting information, and other information regarding a registered dis dispensary are confidential. So in those applications, it's the whole it's security, the security piece. Says, okay, that's embedded in it. Okay, yeah. okay. And it is exempt under other, other exemptions. Under one of the 273. Have you had, um, Shannon, Virginia, have you had any cause to be concerned about 10 and 7, which is the department may disclose, disclose data for statistical or research purposes? Have you ever, have you ever had a breach of that with, uh, uh, you haven't had any challenges no. with that, like DMV with ICE and stuff? Uh, no, we have not. So okay. no, we have to say they do really. The department does a really good job. Yeah, but the, that information is is aggregated information, um, and it's. Um, but it's good to know they yeah. feel the same way that we would hope you feel. Yes. We made a good decision when we put it in DPS. I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do we need to? Um, do we need to have any? separate um, exemptions for dispensaries, or do we just, um, how, how, do, how do we word this? Tucker, do you have any suggestions about how we would do this, or just take out that whole section and just have them be covered under other, other, the other exemptions that exist, and they are very familiar with those exemptions? In so space, meaning. And do yes. those exemptions uh, cover the financers? I don't know. That's something that we might have to ask the Secretary of State's office how that works. I know in our case, that kind of personal information, telephone numbers, we would redact that. 
But even the names, they're wondering about the name and, of the investor. And I would even say even the structure of the deal, potentially, if there was a follow-up with DPS to see the, the terms, the deal itself. You know, with the investor? No, we don't. We don't even, okay. No, I, I, just in case if there was a follow-up, I, I would want to keep that private. My, we could have Tucker check into that for other types of businesses. Do you know? Yes, Tucker. Uh, <clears throat> for the record, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, I'd like to highlight a few issues embedded within the last two minutes of discussion. Uh, the first is without a mandatory and specific exemption, everything that you are talking about, whether it is the security exemptions, which I'll follow up on in just a moment, or the personal information that would be filed in the applications relating to financiers, would be subject to the balancing test. They would not be mandatorily redacted or withheld, right? So that balancing test that we talked about at the beginning from that policy proviso, in section 315, that the public agency would have to balance the public's interest in disclosure against the individual's interest in privacy. So if there were an instance where the public's interest in disclosure outweighed the right to privacy for an individual who is named in that application, their name would be presumably released. Um, and that's true for security too? I thought that was exempt under a different exemption of so, security. The security exemption that is within the enumerated exemptions in 1 BSA 317 relates to public buildings. It relates to public buildings, so those that are least occupied or owned by a public agency, the state, the municipality. Um, if there were security details that were embedded within a public record held by a state agency that did not relate to the public property, something else amorphous or ephemeral out there would have to cover it, otherwise it would be disclosed. Good. So. Thank you. Um, and as far as the Secretary of State's details, my exposure to looking up um, business organizations through the Secretary of State's database it depends, you are correct in the statement, it, it depends on the type of incorporated entity. Uh, you can automatically see the registered agent for every corporation, whether or not private or otherwise <coughs> within the state. Also, uh, I am not sure, you may want to ask Chris or someone from the Secretary of State's office about this, but even LLCs, I believe, have to file some sort of operational agreement where they disclose certain ownership interests. Um, I'm not yeah, sure how Vermont's that. law might relate to, for example, when you have corporations that own LLC interests, whether, you know, beneficial owners of those corporations have to disclose identities or how deep you have to go. It, it might be good to get the corporations. Just the new corporation. Right. <laughs> All right, so I was thinking it was going to be very easy and just <laughs> things are not the security. Do we know we would, we would have absolutely no issue if you stipulated that the security, security yeah. was, was enumerated in this. Yeah. Do we, we know if all the time of that being released? Yeah. If all the dispensaries are organized the same way in terms of LLCs and all yeah. that? I don't think so. No. But it would be good to get brief tests. I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. Good one. Thanks, Mark. I'm here all week. <laughs> but, but I would assume that if, if they're organized in a way that under the Secretary of State's office, and that they must have looked into how, what that organizational meant, right. and what it would mean for their investors and their. Um, and yeah, just on terms everything. of drafting yeah. the language for an exemption, it would probably be important, be important to cover them all. Well, and, and to be clear on which ones we would want to cover. I mean, the ones that are going to form a publicly held company, would, I mean, that's pretty intentional. But if you have a good lawyer, you're going to form under a, under, under the LLC that fits you or whatever it is. 
You're the one that's gotten lost. <laughs> I guess it's a fair <laughs> I don't know. I mean, a good lawyer will tell you what to form under, what is the right structure. But but we could, so we definitely want personnel, uh, personal information, and that that's already covered someplace else. We don't have to put that in. I think right? we want all these things. Are you talking about patients, caregivers? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And healthcare people. That, 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 all these things you want to keep exempt. Yes, but what my question is, do we, we have 273 exemptions out there. Do we need to create additional exemptions around personal information for patients, caregivers, and health care providers for this group, or are they covered under those other 273? Because the, we, every time we create an exemption, we get grief. Right. And Let's that we have too many. So let's be very clear about whether we want to but or whether that, they're covered. Isn't that clear in Title 18, uh, I guess 4474D? And I, 4474D and 4474I, overlapping confidentiality of patient and provider information. And that's where these rules, these rules were based on, on that, that statute. So, so to, I mean, to us, I think this covers it and we would prefer not to see that removed. <clears throat> so it's already there. Well, it's already there, so we don't have to have a... Right, right. so you don't have to add, no one has to be upset. Right, right, and so... I think we just need assurance from Tucker that it's covered. He just said, yeah. Okay, I did, yeah. Yes, it is covered under each of those sections, and just for the purpose of clarification, the ongoing request is that these exemptions be narrowed so that they do not cover locations of dispensaries. So that's all we're doing is getting rid of the exemption of our own location? It, well, is it worth clarifying uh, if they're now non, if they're now for profit, is it worth clarifying some of the corporate structures that would be exempt or not? that may be a little more work. Those aren't, um, that is not, those aren't the only exemptions that are only papers or records that we have on file. We haven't discussed the entire universe. I did touch on, we do get uh, compliance. Yeah. Also letters that we send of non-compliance to yeah. dispensaries um, are not uh, released under public records without permission of the dispensary so you can see yeah um, and so we would like to at least have a discussion about those records yes I think that I, it, it seems it seems to me that I guess I I thought I was pretty clear but I guess I'm not in my own mind but, um, I, I don't know that, is, is Title 18, is that where the dispensary law is? That's where the, yeah. Right, the, so, so I guess what I was thinking was that we did not need to have all of these things listed as co in co confidential, confidentiality. We did not need Section 10 to be there in this same form because patient information all that stuff is is already exempt in, in general in statute. Is am I wrong about that? That's what I was looking at. Is do we need do we need all of this? Well, this is the rules that the Department of Public Safety did. So this comes based from on, this is based on the statute uh, in Title 18, Chapter 86, um, 4474D. Um, and so then the Department of Public Safety did rules. Based on that. This is, yeah. There's a lot of, you know, rules covering everything of, you know, I mean, I don't even know how many pages, it's like 90 it's, pages yeah, it's or something. Pages. It's, it's 100 pages of rules that we have in this program. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is just one page. And that, and all it does is talk around confidentiality. So we already have that in existing rules. Um, and we have that in, in statute. 
So I'm not sure. All right. Well, I personally, I think it doesn't make any sense for some of these things to be kept. I, I think if there, if people have complaints or there are complaints lodged, that that should probably be not confidential because. So it should be exempt. It should be open to the public yeah. to see all the complaints that come in. If if there if people request, I. And is that true that we do with like hospitals and other? We. I think general complaints. There are um, what are called something incidents. What is that called? So Laura Pelosi represent the hospitals and nursing homes. So the, the Division of Licensing and Protection, when they conduct their surveys, those surveys are publicly available through the Division of uh, Licensing and Protection, but not the complaints themselves. Not the complaints themselves, but the surveys. Because I think that it, it gets a little tricky there, because you can have somebody who's making complaints, but have they actually been found to be right, true? Right. 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 So you, you know, and I mean, I think that you know, um, sometimes there's yeah places being targeted. Yeah, oh, we understand that. So if there is a substantiated complaint, is that public? No, no not the complaints. No, I the the finding. No, not no. without permission of the dispensary. How about in hospitals? That, so, yes, yeah, so certainly, certainly yes for nursing homes um, and for residential care and assisted living. Those survey investigation documents are publicly available. Okay. The findings, rather. The findings, yeah. But not from the facilities. It's via state government. Right. It's from. It would be the findings from the department, not from. Save us here, Tucker. Uh, this the scope of this conversation is much larger than I think <clears throat> any of us could appreciate for a few reasons. First, um, these sorts of reviews and complaints are subject to confidentiality under specific provisions in Title 18. Mm -hmm. They're on, uh, entitled to confidentiality under certain licensing provisions in Title 26. And uh, something that we haven't talked about in these public records discussions is that the Public Records Act is an incorporative act in terms of its exemptions so it includes confidential confidentiality provisions in federal law and in common law so for example common law physician patient confidentiality um, or you know federal law HIPAA um, so I can't even begin to deign to describe to you what confidentiality provisions might apply to this particular conversation. Thank you, that was very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the committee, so where do where do we want to go with this or don't we want to? <laughs> I just um, I think it'd be easier to identify the things that are not to be remain remain exempt than it is to I think we should include all the things that are currently exempt, and we should maybe explore the new opportunity that's been identified by Shane, uh, uh, what for-profit structures might be uh, open to public records, and uh, substantiated complaints. Sorry, did you just say that? I mean, I just didn't understand. I, those are the things, that I, what I take, my takeaways from this conversation, but maybe there are more. Are there more? I don't know. I thought we were talking about highlighting things that would no longer be confidential. Mm -hmm. Right, and I just said I'd keep that everything that is and I explore yes. what yes. four structure, formation structures they've chosen. Those may be uh, open to public records and the substantiated complaints. But you'd leave the applications? Yes, I would leave everything that has anything to do with patients or operators or healthcare providers. Uh, well, yeah. But so when somebody files an application to become a new dispensary, that is confidential. Yes. I should say that way. 
their security systems are okay, you know, well, well, yeah, all that would be confidential, but the application itself, the fact that the department can't say so-and-so has applied for an application, but everybody in town knows because they have to go to the zoning board. So, or... And they don't know who all the investors are. Hmm? They won't have to say who all the investors are. Right. We're not looking to release all those names. Right. Right. Okay, well, maybe we just leave it alone. All right. I mean, I thought we would, <laughs> thought it was going to be pretty simple and not have to well, have. Leaving it alone would be fairly simple. Hmm? Leaving it alone would be fairly simple. I know. It just would take a long time to get there. Well, well the two things that have changed since this was established by rule are the for-profit structures and and a history of, of substantiated complaints. So it strikes me that those should be available to be accessed to, you know, that people could ask for public records on those. Well, I, I have no idea about the investors because because I don't know how the, they're set up and that would be regulated by the Secretary of State, I guess. And so some of them may, they may be confidential and some of them may not depending on how they're set up and so that we we don't have to do anything about that I don't think because that's how they set themselves up with the Secretary of State so if they set it up that it's confidential then it's confidential under their corporate right. structure and if it's not we don't have to do anything about it am, am I right about that yeah and and then the only other thing that's left is substantiated complaints yeah and where are we on that? I would think that those should be able to be viewed as a public record if people requested. What do you think? I mean, I, yeah. that's legit. So, um, yeah, I guess that, that would be a question of how do you know? So who, who's making that decision that the complaint has? So it would be DPS that would mm -hmm. be saying that we found uh, reasonable cause or so can I just ask Laura a question, a question? Sure. So, Laura so when so do they release that information like when a hospital has that yeah yes. the, the survey the results the survey findings not the complaint not the investigation just the survey and the findings in the findings yeah. but yeah not where that's right. in in and like but it does do it for each hospital. So yeah. it would be yeah. whether it was Central Vermont Hospital yeah. had this complaint yes. against it. Yeah. Um, but not the like actual complaint, just the findings. Just the yeah. findings. Can I ask well, yeah. do they release the findings if they're substantiated or not substantiated? Yeah, because it's called it's called a Got it. Yeah. yeah. So they, they if they've done if they've done a, if they've gone in to do a survey because they've gotten a complaint. Um, I believe there's, I think the, the 2567 says no substantiation or no findings. Survey is like an investigation? What's that? Survey is like an investigation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's supposed to be they post posted. them all on the website. So. Okay. Hmm. I, I mean, do you want to comment on that? that because it, it would be good, I would think, because if people file complaints, they they often let other people know that they've filed a complaint. I mean, it isn't just that they're going to send them to DPS or to you. They're going to they're going to email all of us, and they're going to call. So they have people. a public log that was, uh, I think, over the years that people had called in that got released this fall. <laughs> so we were. We gave permission for that release to mm -hmm. that public log to be released. There were things in there, though, that I think some of us felt weren't accurate, weren't substantiated. Right. But it was released. And so I do agree with you on, you know, if, if there are formal complaints that are substantiated, yes. Or is. if they're not substantiated, it might be good for you, <laughs> for the public can see that this has not been substantiated at all. Well, I think the question might be to DPS is that depending on how many calls you're getting, 
Um, Why would they? Well, you, yeah, do you have the people power to, um, to investigate all that? We, we're not going to investigate when we get a complaint probably that says, I bought a bag and it has mold in it. And those are some of the complaints. Yeah. However, um, some of the complaints are of a different nature. I don't know. And we have sent letters of non-compliance, and those are not available for public inspection. And I'm not sure any other industry gets that kind of exemption. A letter of non-compliance without a complaint necessarily. Well, or it may have been generated by a complaint, or what? it may be something we, because we do constant, right. Shane will attest that we do constant investigative inspections. And so when you send a letter of non-compliance, are those available, Laura, to, I mean, I was, so they don't, they don't do those. I mean, essentially what it is, is it's either, so there, it's their annual surveys. So you'll either find on their annual investigation that they had no deficiencies, and so that's posted, or that they had deficiencies, and here were those areas of deficiencies. Um, for, um, I'm, I, I do have to confirm how it works on complaints where there's no substantiation, whether they issue a finding of no deficiency or whether they do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but anytime they do a survey with findings, those are posted. Okay. I think in a way we're talking, uh, you know, like the health department doing an inspection of a, a restaurant and they get a grade potentially. I don't think that system was envisioned yet for, for the dispensaries, you know. Um, but then you know you're being inspected, that this is going to be public information. Uh, we've asked for the health department to come in and do inspections. They won't do it. And then back to some of the things uh, the deputy has talked about. Yes, they inspect us if there are items that, you know, yeah, something's not tagged correctly. You'll potentially get a letter saying these plants weren't uh, tagged correctly. You know, how are you going to remediate it? Uh, how fast? And who's in charge of it? You know, and so you respond and you do it, and, and they follow up, and, and then you move on. So some of this is kind of housekeeping in a daily operational sense, you know, and, and so some of it feels um, that releasing it's not going to give much information, whereas there are stuff that you're speaking of uh, potentially. Uh, when I think of a restaurant getting a passing grade for the cleanliness of its kitchen. You know, how could we provide those kinds of insights, I guess? We do have hospitals that get dinged regularly because they're assumed to be um, absolute risk-free environments, and there's no such thing. And so CMS and our own state inspectors are always dinging our hospitals, and that that is public, and they spend a lot of time fighting so, those. Yeah, so right now we currently do have like fire safety that comes in, does inspections and says you have to get this up to code, you have to do this, you have to. So we go through that already, uh, a lot of that. And then on top of that, we have the DPS that comes in, that does their inspections as well, so. Um, yeah. And where are those failures listed, I guess? On the DPS website? They're not, they're not right now. They're, oh, they're, they're not. They're not. They're, 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 exempt. Not. they're exempt. And so part of that is, you know, as a, as a operator, you know, of course, these things are happening. You don't know if they're ha happening at the other location, other businesses, you know, and so then back to, you know, how much is, is all their information being released the same as us being released? And that's where we get into this strange situation of the, in this current law that we get to make that decision of what gets released. Mm -hmm. And as a business, mm -hmm. uh, that's a difficult decision knowing that my competitor might not release that information. So why would I release that mm -hmm. information? Because it's going to be held against me. Mm -hmm. And the perspective of it, what it really means is going to be overblown potentially mm -hmm. uh, versus this is kind of daily housekeeping stuff, uh, considering how many plants we touch, how many packaged items we package in a day. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, people make mistakes. <laughs> so um, uh, and the inspections are there to catch those mistakes, which they do, and then we correct them. So. And some of the letters of non-compliance are not for just these mundane instances, to be clear. They were more severe. We've held a license in, uh, held it off for almost a year because they were not compliant. Um, and I'm not going to say who, because I'm 
allowed to. No. So when we have, when OSHA goes in or somebody else goes in to do a, an inspection of a private company or fire and safety, is any of that public information? Yes. The, the visual it fire is, safety actually is part of the Department of Public Safety. And, the, and that is public information? Those records are generally um, available for inspection. And OSHA hearing, our findings are, are so. It, they're public. Yeah. For some I public. can't speak for OSHA. Well, apparently this gentleman we, can. We've received a lot of records from that. The fire safety, we just, with the matrix kind of story. Mm -hmm. Mark, would you just identify yourself? Mark Johnson, Vermont Digger. So, yes. So, I guess, I guess what, where are we committee? What makes sense to me is for that there's this, this one area, clearly, that we need to do some work on. And maybe we should ask to come in with some language that would, um, so, would make it accessible to people so they don't have to hold it if they don't want to, but that it would also be fair to each of the dispensary owners so that you don't have to make the decision saying, I'd love to release this, but I'm not going to because my competitor isn't going to release it, and therefore I'm not going to release it because, and so it kind of make it fair to everybody. Uh, I would certainly be able to win this at town and see what we can bang on. That's Okay. Mutually agreeable. That would be great. Thank you. And if you think of other things like that, that um, come up with those too. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought this one was going to be a really easy one. Well, it's only like that you get for trying to extort you. <laughs> <laughs> Extortion? I said that we were trying to. Chris sat, Chris sat down there and um, and um, <laughs> somebody said something about were we auctioning off the seats? And I said yes. We're trying to solve the state's debts, and um, that's an endowed chair, so cough it up. That's <laughs> great. And he said, "Are you trying to extort public safety?" Goodbye, Tucker. We'll miss you. Thank you. Okay, I really thought that was going to be yeah. So, is there anything else on um, on uh, public records? We have 15 minutes left on public records that we can hear about. Yes. I would like to see in this bill a um, best practices. A, a, I, I talked about this before, a model for agencies and departments and commissions for how to uh, save their records, how to get them to archives, even how, how to save them as they come in. And we've heard that it, the different agencies and departments and commissions collect them differently. And some do it really well, and some don't. And I would recommend, having heard as much testimony as we've heard, that it's time for us to create a model, you know, that maybe Tanya, uh, who seems to have the best uh, practice, of course, it's her full-time thing. Um, whereas other agencies and departments are doing other, are being busy doing other things. I would uh, love to have a section where we could actually lay out a, uh, uh, or figure out a way to roll out a model, mm -hmm. a best practice for how to um, save your uh, records in this bill. I just think it. It strikes me that that's something that would be helpful for everybody, so that we had a uniform standard on well, how on how every department or agency. Uh, say, the idea would be to make it as easy as possible for the agency exactly. to comply with public records. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So they can't say, "Oh, this is way off in the basement somewhere. We don't know where this is. It can take six months to comply. Right. It's going to cost us twenty thousand dollars to like redact." And exactly. So it's done in a way that's more accessible. So if it's if, if we have a system that's designed to make it you know fairly easy on the way in, then it's easy when it's requested. Then they know where it is and how to get it. There's a, a good system for how to retrieve it. But it's clearly there's a challenge. Uh, I mean, and some departments get many more public records requests than others. But 
clearly one of the barriers and one of the challenges they all face is, is how to retrieve the information. But if it's well organized and there's a good system designed for the coming in for the for how it's stored, then it is less difficult to retrieve it and simpler to retrieve it. And that's kind of I don't disagree, but that's kind of assuming that that's a problem. Which we hear I think we problem. heard that it was a problem. Right, I just don't know what it could be a problem, it could be an excuse. I'm not I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm just saying. I, yeah. But I believe it probably for people whose primary job it isn't, like everybody except Tanya, <laughs> that it is uh, I think uh, it, everybody would benefit from from the from the archives creating a, a, a best practices for how to store public documents? Well, I believe that the archives, that we have given them. She's disappeared, I might yeah, note. But we've given them the ability to, to set um, uh, record retention schedule for everybody that they're supposed to follow and uh, how, to, how to store records. That we haven't told them how to do how to intake records to make it easier but I think that if we're going to do something like that we should have archives working with the agencies we shouldn't come up with a model no but uh, one thing I uh, well however we'd like just like that that conversation because yeah. maybe it is that we uh, ask that 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 archives works with each department each department to, to create a, a uh, a simple and easy system for each department. But I think that that is clearly a barrier and, and makes it harder for, for some places. I, uh, and I also think we aren't financing that work. I mean, I'd like to know if we're actually helping finance that work because if it's going to be an expectation of state government that, that people are going to be able to request public records, we have to be able to finance that in each department, design that system, and, and have it up and running so that they can do it efficiently. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we have to put our money where our expectations are. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we have that I know, but money, we, we but can, we, it's again, it goes back to what Jane talked about in caucus. It's another right. unfunded mandate. Yep. If we expect everyone to be able to equally comply with public records requests, we have to make it simple and straightforward so it doesn't take up a huge amount of taxpayer time and dollars in staff time. Uh, they need to have good, simple, easy systems to store and then to retrieve. And we have to be able to finance that. I think what I've heard. Laura's frowning at me, so I must have said something wrong. <laughs> no, I think that we need, we need to have better systems. I don't know how. Some, I, I don't think there's one, one way of doing it, and everybody has a different Everybody has different types of records that come in. Public um, police records are very different than um, applications for stormwater permits. Um, so every agency has right. So we can't design something that I think. Well, you know, you're, you're, that's a good point. And, and you know, so for example, in economic development, we're, we have been in the process for many years now of creating a digital portal, a one-stop where businesses can come, set up, have, have the same seamless system for tax, for permits, for regulation. For, and we have, we're working with each one of those agencies, uh, ADS, is the Agency of Digital Services, is. You know, we have an embedded person. We're designing it for each, each different department and agency, but it's all designed to make it simple and straightforward and linked into this portal system. Mm -hmm. But I think that we could task, and the obvious one to task it with is, is archives to come up to work with each agency and department to create that system or to review it and say, okay, your system's great. But each, system, each department clearly has to have a system in place that makes it easy for them to save this data and easy for them to retrieve it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's what I've heard. That's like and we got, the, we got, the, we got the, um, the report from them on all the agencies. She gave us the report last time she was here on all the agencies. 
Right, our file is in full, so I will look at that. Yes, it's it should be in there, and uh, it's dated January 27th. Yep, it says SGOC Agency Records Management Programs. Yes, and there's a chart on the back that. says where they are. Yeah, but it doesn't say what the system is or if it's easy or if it's been reviewed by them or any of that. What do you mean? This is their this is their system. This is Vasara's system. This is their records management program. For each department. Mm -hmm. Right. And it has a maturity level, which means it's I'd love to know what that means. It, is, is it still in the design phase? Is it implemented? There's a lot of level ones here. In fact, they're almost all level ones, with a few exceptions, level three and level twos. So I'd love to know from, I don't remember our discussion of that. But, but we should look at that before. Right. Yeah. And, and I'd love to talk with Tanya about how, yeah. All right. So what other um, things do we need to look at in public records? Chris? So we had a conversation briefly in passing, but I don't know if we ever landed on anything. And that was the idea of um, doing some kind of survey that would reveal the cost to the state of providing public records. Um, the idea that if we're going to to me on some sort of ideal level, all information would be freely accessible. And they could say, uh, you might say, we, we don't know how much that costs. And so, uh, but I think about if we had a figure, we might make a judgment as to whether or not we think, well, it's important enough to transparency and democratic process that we make all these available records at no cost and that we write the check to write that service. Yeah. Because we decided, oh, that was, this is valuable enough to the state, we want to cover those costs. As opposed to the current fee-based system, which is kind of irregular and in some cases um, obstructive to people getting information. Well, we also talked about um so that's really like homework before making a bigger decision, like how much yeah. would it cost? Is yeah. Really the question. Right, and there's the way it is now is you pay if you're going to copy and you don't pay if you just inspect. And lots of agencies are doing it that way. And do we make it no cost even if you're going to just, if you're going to copy, which means that all of those um, companies that are asking for lots of com copies are going to just end up paying for the two cents for the copy itself. Because it's not worth it for them to send somebody here from Kentucky or wherever to, ins to be able to inspect them for free. So they're paying for the time to it itself yeah and that's that's an issue yeah it is so okay well we'll we'll we should ask the different agencies how much revenue they get from charging for public records and I think it sounds like from the Attorney General's testimony that would get a little complicated for instance they charge in a rate that's far less uh, lawyer times uh, rates far lower than probably their term cost for right. having that lawyer doing that work. But again, you know, I think you might feel like, uh, you know, and someone said, well, why would I, uh, why wouldn't the, uh, an office want to provide freely information that could lead to a suit against that office? I think was part of the way it was phrased. And you know, I, I would say, because it's conceivable that office may not be operating in a manner that would uh, be uh, consistent, that would be compliant with law. 
or practice or rule or program or guidance. So if you could, I'm not saying anyone's doing that intentionally, but there's good reason that you would provide free access to that information. For everybody. You can't. That's right, for everybody, right? We heard that whole thing, regardless of intent, who, why. Right. Could be a, this is a cost for running an open and transparent democracy. It's the cost, but we are not, we're not helping finance it, I don't think. Oh, not at all. My guess is right. it yeah. costs a huge amount. It's going to be a huge amount. When you what, right, and I'm just saying it's hard to have a rational discussion right. without information. Right, and we need that information because just listening to the talk from the AG's office about the time and the at, at lawyers' rates, which they charge out at whatever, even at public service rates, it's quite high. Um, but I agree with you. I think that's okay. a key piece of information we need. All right, so we'll ask. Yeah, and just to go back to Tanya to the to the to the best practices for the system of retention and distribution. She has targeted assistance. They have target. They've assisted uh, 20 agencies or departments, and, <coughs> and no, there are 24, a larger number that still have not had help, and their maturity levels, i.e. They haven't gotten off either. I don't know what level one means, but my guess is at the bottom of the barrel are all level one. So the vast majority are at level one, whatever that means, but I assume that means it's fairly established. But we'll find out from time. Mm -hmm. Well, she did say that Agency of Human Services because they have a person dedicated to right. it. Is exactly. In the best shape, and they're mostly le level twos and threes. Right, and three. they are. But look at the vast majority are level ones. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll I'll just we'll send a note to every secretary and say give us a ballpark figure of how much. Yeah, what and, you and one of the one of the things that we did hear from people was that they were okay with the way it was. Um, I mean, the ACLU testified that while they would like it to be free for everybody, they were okay with the way it was now with charging for the time for copying, not charging for inspection. So, we'll, all right. Okay, we'll do this again next week. And I'll, we'll get those figures, and then we'll get Tanya here. And, and, and uh, is, it, is there anything else that any other, other than just the kind of those are public records, the access and stuff. Is there any other very specific thing that should be put in here as long as we're dealing with public records, like the dispensaries that we so elegantly dispose of? I mean, is there any, any other single issue that needs to be in here? Tom, did you have one? Uh, well, Madam Chair, for the record, uh, thank you. Tom Abdullar, uh, representing the Boston Employees Association. Um, our position would be that if there's any expansion of the entities um, that should be subject to the same level of scrutiny through public records requests uh, that governmental entities are, as the bill as initially drafted suggests, that those entities should include um, both creative workforce solutions. Um, which was an entity created, I believe, in the mm -hmm. Douglas administration that acts sort of as a parallel department of labor for the clients of the Agency of Human Services, um, that they should be included mm -hmm. um, in, in any such scrutiny, and also Faber. Mm -hmm. um, which what's, is, what's Faber? Faber, Senator Clarkson, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin their acronyms, Vermont Association of Business, Industry, and Rehabilitation, oh, right, right. Okay. which essentially acts as a parallel yeah. to the work that's done by the Division of Vocational okay. Rehabilitation. Got it. Um, okay. We would suggest that they should um, be included in any expansion of, um, of the ability of non-governmental entities to be subject to public records. Well, we haven't we haven't even we haven't looked. We haven't taken much testimony on that at all yet. And I understand. It's so I hesitate to name specific, and I know it does in that bill. But I ask. I will listen to you would suggest. Right. That no. If, if there are specific issues beyond the public, beyond the expansion to nonprofits, 
and the dispensaries and whether we charge or not. And so those are three major issues around public records. If, are there other identifiable issues around public records that we should put in here while we're dealing with it? The, in my opinion, public records and open meeting laws are probably something that are going to have to be dealt with every single year as technology changes and they, I, I don't know, I, I don't think they are well, and solvable and then you're done. So, but if there are other issues, get them to us so that we can get them in here because we've got to move on this. Yeah. And just to be clear, Dr. I wasn't yeah. requesting that they specifically be named. We would just hope that, what, that for example, Legislative Council would ensure that they would be covered in, that in the aegis of okay. the entities that you're considering. Okay, Chris? Well, you mentioned it, but I, I wanted to know more about why you know, in section three and four. In which, in the 305 or in the 305? In 305. It, you know, the single jobs fund is called that. Yeah. And, uh, and vital. We're going to yeah. do it. So I didn't know if you were planning on looking into that prior to getting other information or you want to sort out the big picture stuff before getting it. Either, either way, we have to do all of it. So we have to hear from both. The, the, um, whether we expand it, this is a vehicle for us to use. Whether we pass this bill at, in any form at all or just use the number is up to us and what we do. Vital, I think, has already been solved in a court case. That was... Well, we should hear that and find out. We did. Yeah, what's going on. But definitely Ellen wants to speak because she's very concerned about this being included. But so, I, I would say we have to look, you know, this opens it up to the BSL, the Vermont Arts Camp. I mean, this opens it up to a huge Everybody. So, so they take Pandora's. Right, but so, so we have really three issues. We have this one, do we want to pursue this? Do we want to um, look at how we charge and when we charge? Okay. And the dispensary. So right now we have those three. If there are other specific issues that we want to get in here, bring them up, send them in. Yeah. yeah and under that, I think the cost and and the systems. You know, what's this, how, how to make yeah. it easier. And yeah. so those are the two big issues: the, the cost and the systems. Maybe you can't you can't charge unless you have a system put in place that makes it easy to to do. Okay. Okay, so we will do this again next week, everybody. Oh boy. <laughs> so